Hi, I'm Dr. Andy Martin. I want to welcome you to the Marcus Heart Valve Center, but most of all, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Tyrone David. Tyrone is known to many of you. He's a professor of surgery, cardiac surgery in Toronto, uh, certainly an endowed chair in Toronto, and the uh, Melanie Monk in the Peter Monk Center. And many of you know Tyrone is past president of the American Association of Thoracic Surgeons. And I think you've gotten the prestigious Order of Canada. In fact, that might be what you have on your rappel. It is indeed. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure. You know, it's great to have you here in Atlanta. Tyrone, you know, you've had an incredible career. Um, you've helped so many people, and certainly we've all learned from you so much. I want, I want to ask you to look back. So in your lifetime as a cardiac surgeon, uh, what do you think have been the major changes or advances that you've seen in cardiovascular surgery? Oh gosh, I mean, every, every, everything changed from the day I trained and uh, from the days I began to practice. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint one uh, particular event that the most exciting thing about the specialty, it, it doesn't stop change. And, and it's true, we, we, uh, we don't know where it's gonna go. Uh, if you uh, lay back for a few years, I don't think you can catch up anymore. It's, uh, uh, changes are here to stay, but uh, uh, we transform coronary artery disease and its management. We transform the management of heart valve disease. We are transforming the management of aortic diseases. And I, at the same time, the molecular developments on these areas is quite uh, spectacular. Ultimately, it's going to be all molecules, but meantime, we and I have to uh, patch up the holes with uh, with, Manual with, things. But, but you've seen, I mean, you know, in your lifetime, so you, you arrived in Toronto in 78? Well, 75 as, 75, I, as, a, as okay. a resident, as I said. Because, I mean, a, I, you know, I look back and my first real exposure to um, primetime cardiac surgery was when I was doing my internship at Stanford in the late 60s. Okay, so, you know, when I look uh, back. But that was a transforming place as well. Shumway well, had the. Uh, and, but I mean, I'm thinking back on, you know, how cardiac surgery and really the approach to the cardiovascular patient is really has changed. But you're right, excellence in surgery and things have, have never changed. Uh, absolutely. I, I, uh, we all need the mentors, and my mentor was Dr., the late Dr. Bigelow. And uh, Bigelow told me, uh, you have to develop a niche, and uh, you should go away see how people think and do and bring back some, some new knowledge and try to develop your own. Uh, and it was the uh, motive why I picked heart valve disease to, uh, as the area where I should uh, focus myself and, and try to change, try to improve the way things were done. If you look back when I finished my training in 1978, there was a closed mitral valve split uh, Carpentier in France was talking about the open repair of mitral valve, not only rheumatics, but the mitral insufficiency as well. And the rest was all replacement. It was all valve replacement. Uh, the irony is heart surgery started as only repairing valves. Interesting. Because there was no prosthetic valve available. Interesting. And then the moment the uh, star Edward became available, they said the problem solved. Let's replace any disease valve with a ball in a cage. That was the current thought in 1964 until the 70s. And of course, we started seeing the problems in replacing right. valves, we went back to uh, repairing them again. But nothing happened in isolation. You, you guys really coached us what to do and when to do, uh, what to do in the operate room. The transforming technology was uh, intraoperative echocardiography. I was very lucky. I had a guy like you are, an expert in echo, and more importantly, he uh, was given the first transophageal probe to see if it works or not. So instead to get images by taking a probe, put a condom in a right. transthoracic probe and putting it on top of the heart, suddenly, you know, it wasn't compressing my delicate heart anymore, <laughs> both the patient and mine, yeah. and giving even better images. That opened the door to a new set of developments that, uh, again, I, I, I think it transformed heart valve disease. 
I mean, it, it's, it is really dramatic when you think about the, um, you know, <laughs> prosthetic valves coming along and they were mechanical and then they were tissue. And, but the concept that it started with repairing valves and all those things. So, so there's been a, advances in how you, you understand the pathophysiology of valvular heart disease pretty dramatically and then the, the technological support. What about the concept of now where it used to be the surgeon was the the king or the island unto himself and a few herselves, but now there really is a, it's really an orchestrated sort of team approach, isn't it? Well, I, if you take a look globally, and, and I, I have traveled a lot in my sure. career, uh, it's not always this way. In the United States, it appeared to be the surgeon's the king, the guy who controls everything. It was not the same elsewhere. If you take a look in Europe, perhaps in England and Germany, the surgeon as well, but uh, other countries, no. In Canada, from the beginning, I was impressed by the relationship, non-competitive relationship between professionals. Right. Where the patient was the most important thing, all, all of us together, what can you do for the betterment of patient care? And perhaps because there was no financial interest in one or the sure. other. That's, is, a, that's a very interesting it, point. It could be because you, are, you get a paycheck no matter what, so may as well do something that's good as opposed to be competitive financially. I don't know if the money is on the only well, it's issue. An interest, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. But uh, if you take a look at large institutions in the United States, uh, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, where I spent 40 years, uh, the collaborative practice model was there back in the days I was a resident. I was very impressed by how much cardiologists spoke to surgeons, spoke to anesthesiologists, and together they tried to work for the common good. And, it, and it's interesting that you said the emphasis was on the patient. I mean, I think that's really good. Let me, let me ask you to switch gears now, okay, because you've been really at the forefront of a lot of developments in valvular heart surgeries and therapies. I want you to look forward. So when you and I are a dentalist and in our rocking chair at some point, <laughs> I hope we're not a dentalist, but when you and I are sitting out there, what do you think the future holds for approaches to mitral and aortic valve disease? Listen, only a decade ago, when I was told that you could deploy a tissue valve inside a pulmonary valve, I thought these guys are dreamers. And then by 2008, only three or four years later, I jumped in this bandwagon because right. uh, John Webb in Canada was not doing only pulmonaries. He said it works in the aortic too. And, and I couldn't believe 10 years ago that would work because uh, how can a block of calcium that we, we struggle to remove carefully? And if we left a piece of calcium in the annulus and tried to put a prosthesis into the calcium, he became detached six months later or a year later. And you guys complained to us, <laughs> lousy operation. We don't know how to do an aortic valve or mitral valve replacement because if you left calcium in, it would be a, a bad outcome. And yet, now you use the presence of the calcium to hold, to hold a valve. stent that works like a valve. So I think Abraham Lincoln had the proper statement for the future. Uh, the good thing about the future, he said, it comes one day at a time. So do a good job today. Stay current what you do now, and likely uh, tomorrow is going to be easy to, uh, to accept. I don't know which way you're going to go. I think this uh, new wave of uh, technology where less invasive methods are used to treat right. heart valve disease and other diseases too, like aneurysms or coronary artery disease, I think is here to stay, and it's going to get better and better and better. I think percutaneous aortic valve deployment, when I say percutaneous, I mean transfemoral. Right. The moment you start cutting the chest, I'm not so sure it's much better than a, a mini toracotomy to replace the valve on bypass. Okay. Uh, it remains to be proven that that's less harmful than an open heart surgery. But a transfemoral deployment of a, an aortic valve prosthesis, that's I don't know how much you are doing here. We're doing, we're doing a lot. They should go home in two days. They are out. And we have a, we create a bunch of complex patients by doing surgery and prolong their lives. And if you try to reoperate it 30 times, fourth time, we end up killing 
a large number. Right. And if you can deploy a valve and they're not asked for two or three days, I think it's remarkable the uh, difference it has made in the lives of so many patients. The, you mentioned, I want to I finish up in a second, but I, two, two points. One, you, you mentioned about uh, aortic and the transapical approach. What about for a lot of interest now in secondary mitral regurgitation, functional MR? Do you, do you think we're going we're gonna to make progress with that? With, uh, that that's going to be much slower because of the complexity, complexity. of the okay. valve. Okay. Aortic and pulmonary valves are two structures that contain a cylinder. Aortic is a bit more complicated than pulmonary because the coronary arts are in your right, way. Right. And they are the devil to you guys. Absolutely. Uh, if you lose coronary arteries, it's a, it's a problem. And uh, in bicuspid aortic valve, is a problem. Calcified bicuspid aortic valve. Because frequently it's too large. The block of calcium is much larger than the uh, senile calcification. Mitral and tricuspid valve, they are very complicated structures. Tricuspid it's complicated even to us when you operate in an open heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a strange structure. It's a valve, three separate parts. One part belongs to the left ventricle, the septal. Mm -hmm. The other ones to the free wall, but the free wall is a tube, a U-shaped tube. So uh, we don't do very well in tricuspid valve repair because of the complexity of the functionality. Mitral is a bit simpler. It would do a bit better in mitral valve. But both of them would be very difficult to resolve dysfunctional percutaneously. And I think it would not be always a compromise on be as good as they work in pulmonary have been. Interesting. Finally, let me ask you, you mentioned early on about this whole concept of molecular sort of, are we going to be entering, do you think in our lifetime we'll be growing valves, growing structures, entering a different way of treating them? Uh, I'm really getting at this concept of surgical transcatheter techniques, is there going to be, is it, you think it might be another revolution? I, I have been wrong before, it might be wrong again now. It's difficult to foresee the future. We, we try very extensively for 30 years now to grow our own virus, right. and it's a problem. However, having said that, there's a new product commercially available called the Core Matrix. Mm -hmm. I have to confess to you, I'm highly impressed by what happens to patches of core matrix when you replace part of the valves. We have a paper coming up showing that uh, if you patch a mitral valve, uh, depending on the time that you examine the mitral valve, there is no patch left. There is only normal three-layer leaflet tissue. So you're putting basically scaffolding in there and something that well, grows no, in. Well, it's a membrane. It's a membrane. It's a, it's a, okay, it's a so ply of a extracellular membrane, and I'm not sure the four ply is enough right, for right, a very right. high pressure area. We are learning this yet, but uh, I have about a dozen patients now in whom I have done this. And it's a learning experience. Those that put a, a single layer, uh, one broke. So next patient I put double layer. Is up to a year and a half now, and you cannot tell that patient had a replace of one leaflet. And, and fascinating. Look what happened to Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex was introduced back in 85. I introduced clinic Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex in the cord attention became the standard. Gore-Tex in repairing the aortic valve is the standard and doesn't fail. We have 30 years follow-up now that that's, although a synthetic material, becomes incorporated into the uh, native tissue it probably is a permanent solution. I, I think, yes, we're going to develop uh, technology and knowledge enough to create our own valves. I mean, it's going to be from uh, stem cells to our valve. That's a further down the line. But uh, taking tissue that perhaps are able to attract whatever it takes to create a part of the valve, I think is happening now. Is going to have more and more in the near future. I mean, it's going to be really important because obviously the aging population the, and, you know, valvular heart disease is increasing. Well, I want to, you know, I appreciate so much your uh, spending time with me. And most of all, I appreciate your excellence in what you do. You've, you've elevated the level of cardiovascular wow. surgery throughout the world. And, you know, you're incredibly respected. And I, I value you. that and I value your friendship. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Randy.